Hello, and welcome to our talk today on building and deploying a next generation IPTV platform. Uh, I'm Jim Denany with Bestma Networks. Um, I'm part of the office of the CTO and have responsibility for our content delivery and storage uh, technology direction. I'm happy to have with me here today, Bill Chatwell, and uh, I'm gonna let Bill say a few words to introduce himself. Sure, hello everybody. My name again is Bill Chatwell. I'm the director of video systems at Midco. Uh, my area of responsibility is basically um, taking content from ingest all the way to delivery to the home, uh, all the storage and processing of our video product in between, as well as managing the UX and CP related to our video products here at Midco. Great, thanks Bill. Okay, so we're going to go through um, kind of the general state of the streaming industry, um, uh, including uh, kind of usage patterns, people's preferences, um, and then how those align with this opportunity for uh, deploying a, a next generation IPTV or pay TV platform. Um, and then we'll get into some of the kind of fundamental underlying technologies that make that all possible. Okay, let's start by talking about the current state of streaming and some of the market dynamics. Um, no secret, people are watching a lot of video. Uh, they were before the global pandemic of 2020 and that only drove even more usage, especially when people started on their uh, uh, social distancing and shelter in place initiatives. Uh, video drives data usage. So depending on which study you look at, video over the internet is, is driving 60 plus percent of the actual data consumed. Um, as I was preparing for this presentation, one of the things that I found in, in my research was that there's a lot, of, a lot written about the move toward cord cutting. And that's a trend that's been happening and, and we've all known about for a while. But there's also a growth opportunity for IPTV, especially an IPTV service that complements uh, uh, the, the OTT services that are popular with people and doesn't attempt to build a walled garden, but actually is focused on aggregating the, the managed content from the pay TV service, as well as the popular OTT content. And that kind of leads to what I've uh, termed the bundle squared. So, uh, the bundle of, of video and data, uh, the, the double play is uh, complementary. And if you build a service that also embraces popular OTT content, then you get the multiplying effect of the OTT content also driving your data usage and your loyalty to your broadband service. Bill, you have any, any uh, thoughts to add to this? Yeah, I mean, definitely to your, to your last point, we've certainly found that customers churn less when they have video and internet versus just internet alone. Um, so certainly being able to, to have a video product, a compelling video product in this day and age uh, to offer alongside our broadband does, does reduce churn, uh, you know, increases revenue, no, no question whatsoever. A uh, couple other points as you go up above the, the advent of next gen broadband. I mean, I think part of your point was we're going to need this next gen broadband to support all of the, the video consumption, which actually on our network uh, is closer to 70% of the data consumed um, mm -hmm. is video. So it's actually even higher than some of the numbers that, that you have. Um, but then you're going to need to migrate your video, you know, your native facilities based video to an IP platform to vacate those qualm carriers to to enable you know 5g tech not so much 5g in a cable plant but 10g technologies mm -hmm. and certainly it's your only way to deliver video to a fiber to the home uh, unless you want to do an rf overlay which is you know not particularly cost effective so sounds a little bit like a self-fulfilling prophecy you, you really have to do it yeah i mean it's uh, <laughs> That's exactly right. It becomes somewhat circular. You need you need more bandwidth, more you know the next gen broadband networks to enable video, but you also need to migrate your video using the better video codecs, delivering VIP to ultimately get the bandwidth back um, to support that. Yep, sounds good. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, 
So moving on to um, user preferences uh, with the current state of streaming. So um, time, place, and device shifting. Uh, it's really about convenience. So you know, people want to view on their favorite devices, and those are changing all the time. Um, they also want to view on their on their own schedules. So, um, so time shifting is important. Uh, and then uh, they also want to view where they want to view. So that could be different rooms in the home. Uh, it could also be outside the home if if rights are available for that. So so that combination of things is is really critical to users, and they and they just flat out expect it. Uh, ease of use is another important point. Um, you know, getting things set up and, and working easily uh, is really critical. Uh, you know, back to the aggregation point, um, a, a sort of central device uh, in the home uh, that allows the people to get to their, their pay TV content as well as their favorite OTT is, is really important. And these modern architectures enable exactly that. Uh, live, still important to people. Uh, live sports are, are, are back now, um, different, <laughs> empty stadiums and things like that. But, um, you know, the NFL launched in, in uh, North America this past weekend and, um, and, and people aren't going to the games, but a lot of people are viewing uh, live. Um, and variety, there, there's so much variety. Uh, people are, are uh, coming up with new ways to offer content and uh, and people are finding those ways uh, that they like to view it. Um, this graphic over on the right is uh, from uh, the streamingmedia.com recently highlighted a, an annual study by the hub about uh, people's preferences for, for viewing content. And I thought it was uh, interesting because uh, these, are, these are the things that people chose as the reason for choosing their default service. So the one that if they had to drop everything else, um, they would go to this default service. And these were the reasons. And I'm not going to read through them all again, but they're, they're very much aligned with, um, with what we just said, which are things that this, this uh, modern IPTV architecture uh, creates. Bill, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think this really hits all the main points of, you know, where we need to go with a video product, you know, regardless of whether it's IP based or still legacy QAM based, but you certainly can't enable all of these unless it's an IP based video service. Um, aggregation's huge. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to be able to deliver to different devices, uh, mobile devices, tablets, so on and so forth. Uh, in potentially outside the home, as you mentioned, when rights are available. Um, but beyond that, you need to have a great 10 foot experience, you know, on the big TV where you're not just giving the customer, you know, the video you're providing as an operator, which is, you know, very much the, the local news broadcast. Um, sports certainly is a huge part of it and all the other, you know, variety channels. But the ability to aggregate so they're not having to constantly switch over to the smart tv to watch netflix hulu whatever you know you're providing that in the ux where it's not only can you get to those different ott apps from the ux without having to switch around you're integrating that within the native search and browse capability of that ux um so if somebody's looking for a particular movie they're able to find it regardless of the source and you know, delivering your video via IP starts to, to get where um, the experience becomes very similar for the customer. So it's not like you kind of mentioned like a walled garden or a significant change from watching something you know, from the cable operator versus something on Netflix. It becomes yeah. much more seamless. The network operator business. So you're the network operator here, so I'm gonna let you speak to this slide. Um, I'll just mention that the, the business is the network and um, and what we're talking about here is uh, very well uh, aligned and supportive of, of that. Um, one other point I'll make is flexibility and um, the, the, the world is changing and the streaming world is changing and uh, we can't sit here and predict, you know, what device is going to be popular months or years from now and what type of viewing model is going to be going to be popular and needed. 
Uh, so the flexibility in the underlying system, and, and this really gets into a, a software defined uh, type of infrastructure is critical uh, for the operator to be able to uh, continue to adapt and grow this kind of business. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've already touched on a few of these points, but I'll go back through and maybe expand on them a little bit. The invest and grow the IP network. At the end of the day, uh, an operator, whether you're a cable operator, fiber to the home, telco, whatever type of operator you are, ultimately, if you're not already there, you really need to get all your services to IP at some point. You know, the end goal is to no longer have silos on your, your broadband network where, you know, video is taking 40%, 50% of your spectrum, only leaving half of it for, for data service. Um, at the end of the day, you need to get everything into that one common format of IP. It makes your network much more efficient. It makes the, the realization of a, you know, a 10 gigabit type goal in the next few years a reality. Um, controlling infrastructure costs, it's much easier to manage an IP-based network um, for video than it is when you're doing, you know, legacy QAM. You no longer need QAM modulators at every major hub site or head end site. Um, there's much less data processing. You're doing it in a couple centralized areas and then you have fairly simple, you know, caching devices at the edge, you know, that you can scale as needed. Um, you know, certainly increasing su subscribers and, and ARPU, yeah, I mean, that's, that's obviously the goal at the end of the day. We touched on that already where, you know, if you're, your broadband subs, in many cases, they may have plateaued depending on, you know, the markets you're in and whatnot. You may have started to see some data customer plateauing because you've penetrated the market pretty well already. Then you start to see churn, which obviously is not desirable. The more products that customer is getting from you, the less likely they are to churn as long as you're doing a good job with those products. Mm -hmm. And then certainly the flexibility you, you mentioned, adjusting the trends. I mean, we can only speculate what some of the trends are going to be in the future, but, you know, having a system that can, you know, not only deliver good quality HD at, at lower bandwidth consumption today, um, which is more efficient, but the ability to, to move to 4K, you know, not to just be able to offer 4K from, from other OTT providers, but to offer, you know, your own 4K products. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do that. Um, and you need to have, you know, an infrastructure in place where it's, you know, just software, changes to the software, updates to the software, uh, configuration changes. And then scalability, certainly, um, you know, you're not going to build this from day one to support every single video customer you have today on Qualm. You're going to build it for a certain percentage of that, and then you're going to scale it as needed. Um, you may have to scale it out a little faster than you thought, maybe a little slower, but at the end of the day, um, you don't want to try and build something today for the end goal. It might be a couple years away, yeah. not knowing exactly where you end up. You just need the building blocks that allow you to get there without having to, you know, forklift stuff along the way. Yeah, you kind of read my mind there with that last part. You know, it's not, I imagine it's, well, I imagine and I know that it's not going to be a, a flip the switch and you move everybody um, that you've already got as a subscriber on a legacy system over to the new system. It's going to be a, a, a migration process and, um, you know, being able to, to bear those costs as the business grows is, I would, I would think is very important. No, it certainly is. And to your point, I mean, you know, most of our rollouts of an IPTV product are, are going to be cap and grow uh, to start with, but obviously within the next couple of years, there needs to be a migration plan to ultimately get all of your customers off Quam and on your IP platform. Great. All right. Let's take a, a quick minute and talk about, the legacy pay TV services, um, and then we'll move into the more modern architectures. So, uh, Bill, why don't you uh, talk to this for a second? Sure. I mean, it's certainly one of the goals or the main goal of an IP of deploying an IP TV system, IP services for your video is to, to ultimately, you know, not only improve what you had in your legacy world, but to ultimately, you know, migrate off your legacy pay services to an IP based. I mean, some of the things here are pretty obvious. Anybody that's worked in the industry anytime realizes that the, the old CP with the RF tuners in it, hard drives is big, it looks old, it's expensive. So moving to IPTV allows you to start deploying, you know, boxes, small set top boxes that are they're much cheaper, much more cost effective, 
they look modern. So when you're walking in, you may still be providing a, a set top box to the customer of some sort. It's, you know, it comes to them at a much lower cost and it looks modern, um, yet it's gonna be far more capable as far as the UX is concerned. Um, we've already touched on it, but you know, ultimately getting your video off a of dedicated RF plant, very important. So as you move to bring your own devices, um, and other things that only work with an IP video feed, you have to be providing an IP video feed. And then the maintenance and support challenges. Um, at the end of the day, IPTV services are much easier to support because it's more centralized. Um, there's fewer touch points. And once your video is over IP, your, your techs in the home or various different places in your network, in your, your head ends, your, your sites, they're troubleshooting IP. They're no longer troubleshooting RF specific stuff, um, at least not specific to video. And, you know, you get rid of a lot of the, the video intricacies um, that require a different skill set or different troubleshooting um, as, as they go along the way. So it, it simplifies uh, maintenance and support and ultimately it'll reduce truck rolls. All right. All right. So let's move from the legacy to the, the modern architecture that we've been talking about. Um, so, um, you know, looking at this architecture, you know, kind of working uh, left to right, um, the system's got to be able to ingest both linear and, and VOD content. So you've got to be able to, to bring that content into the system. Um, and then, you know, for the linear content, make it, make it time shiftable. So that is, you know, recording and, and enabling some of the things that we, we talked about. Um, then, you know, as we, as we discussed, the content is going to be consumed on lots of different devices. And so being able to package and uh, protect that content uh, is, is really important. So having software in the architecture to do those things dynamically is critical. Uh, we've also got things on here, uh, you know, which are also more dynamic in nature, like ad insertion for, uh, you know, you can go with geo or, or very targeted ad insertion um, and integration with other systems like uh, DRM systems for the content protection. And of course, uh, analytics and monitoring is, is critical to any, any system. Um, then you've got your, your CDN, your actual content delivery network, which is made up of caches or tiers of caches um, that are typically located as close as they can get to the subscriber um, and then delivering those into the home into all these devices. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Bill here and, and have you talk about um, the Midco TV service and uh, the use cases that you enable with this architecture. And then we're going to get into some of these key underlying um, uh, essential technologies that make all this possible. Thanks, Jim. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've certainly deployed a, a CDN for video delivery, you know, in an IP world. And to Jim's point, you know, the concept is you're you're going to you're you're spending the majority of your money at one or two head ends, depending on, you know, redundancy or geo diversity. But the bulk of it's going to be at I'll call it a master head end. Um, where you're doing the majority of your content ingest, you're doing your processing, you're doing the majority of your storage, uh, and then you get an economy of scale. So as you need to add more storage for more customers to use DVR, um, you're doing it at one or two locations, um, which is far more efficient, far more cost effective. And then you know you have your, your own network to get to all your different hub sites, all your different markets. Obviously that needs to be robust and scalable in and of itself. Uh, which is a different conversation, but then at the edge, as Jim mentioned, that's where you're going to put in your edge caching. And depending on how many customers you're serving, maybe you can serve two, three markets or one big market with a, you know, a simple cache implementation. Um, but over time, as you get, hopefully get more customers, they're using more bandwidth for your service. You're going to push that deeper into the edge, closer to the customer home, but you want to be able to do that, you know, at your pace and, and affordably, of course. Um, architectural options, um, you know, that, that's one thing that's kind of dizzying is there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat in delivering an IPTV service. Uh, the basic components though are kind of an origin storage site, 
uh, which is what I kind of mentioned where you're spending, you know, the majority of your money on your processing and storage at, at one or two main head ends and then distributing, you know, the caching um, across your network. Um, but, you know, any system you choose is going to have to support whatever your goals are, whether it's geodiversity, you know, two head ends feeding two different geographical areas, or whether it's full redundancy, or maybe you start with one architecture and ultimately evolve it into the other architecture where maybe you have two head ends and they are fully redundant. You know, one, one disappears, gets hit by a tornado, whatever, it's unrecoverable for months. You're able to continue your service going nearly uninterrupted out of the other location. Let's get into some of these technical details. So um, talking about scalable ingest and storage, um, it's, it, it's very important to be able to scale your storage system, both for, for depth of storage and for, for IO. And the way we've done that is we've created a technology that we call a hybrid object storage system. So we've, we've done that by combining different types of storage media, flash and spinning hard drives, uh, video use cases, live and, and recorded content that needs to be viewed as it's being recorded or, or written into the storage system, as well as you know, static content that's not changing anymore. And, and so this system has allowed us to uh, be able to scale those use cases independently as needed and, um, and offer a very cost-effective solution to customers in doing so. Um, the other part of, of this and the reason we call it the platform is that uh, we run our, our media applications in what we call a hyperconverged model. So these are media applications running in uh, containers on the storage hardware. So we reduce the overall footprint of the system um, and, uh, and those are all managed by an embedded uh, container orchestration system. In order to uh, be able to serve this content to all the, the different types of devices and for the use cases that are required, it's very important to uh, be able to dynamically adapt the content that's in the system. So store it once, ingest it once if it's a, live, if it's a linear channel, um, but be able to adapt it to the different types of devices that people are using. The, Different devices use different media formats, different uh, adaptive bitrate formats, and different content protection schemes, and we don't know what's coming down the road. So uh, being able to package and protect content uh, on the fly or just in time is, an, is a very important aspect of a system like this. So, so now clients. Obviously, you know, we talked a lot about aggregation and ease of use and those sorts of things. So um, the, the client is a, is a key component in these systems. Uh, I'm going to let Bill talk about Midco TV and how you're using Android TV as part of that service and other devices that you'll plan to be, to use as part of the service. Sure, Jim. So Midco TV is kind of our, is our brand name for our IPTV product. Um, highly aggregated UX, um, that brings in both OTT services voice integration, search discovery, along with, you know, Midco's video product as well. So, you know, highly integrated, um, strives for that content aggregation, holy grail that we've been talking about, certain amount of personalization. Uh, it is easy to use, um, you know, I guess that's all in the eye of the beholder, but you know, the, it's not a completely different UX format from some of the better ones on the market today. So it's, it's evolutionary, not revolutionary in that standpoint, um, but it's certainly modern and it's super functional. Um, mobile devices, bring your own device. Um, started down that road, we have apps available for you know, Android, iOS apps and tablets. Over time, we'll add more apps for more BYOD devices, you know, leveraging the ability of, of IP delivered video. Um, back to the top point, no hard drive certainly makes for a lower cost um, set top box if you are providing one. Um, in our case, we are that leverages the Android TV operating system. You can download your own OTT apps in addition to uh, you know all the stuff that we're providing um, right out of the box with the with the product. Uh, the concept of no truck rolls, you know, I think the reality is that no truck rolls probably won't mean no truck rolls, but very reduced. Um, it really is a product that allows for 
self-install. Most customers are going to use Wi-Fi. It works very well with a Wi-Fi connection, so you don't even need hardware or Ethernet, much less um, hardwired coax. So, you know, the goal 75, 80% or more DIY installs, which is much higher than our current, you know, install rate for legacy video products. Um, easier troubleshooting path. Again, no truck rolls will likely never mean no truck rolls, but significantly reduced, which is, you know, a huge benefit to the company on the OPEX side of things. And then certainly a huge benefit on capital. Um, due to the much lower cost set top box compared to legacy and, and you can pass those savings on to your customer um, by not having to uh, charge as much for certain aspects of your service. So it's kind of a win-win. Great. Thank, thanks, Bill. Okay. Um, we've talked about scaling um, already and we'll, we'll touch on it again. Um, there, it's important uh, to be able to scale the system dynamically as we've we've discussed um, and having architectural flexibility is, is really critical. Um, so, you know, the parts of the system that have to be able to dynamically scale. And again, you know, going back to being software defined and moving toward more of a cloud deployable architecture is really important for these things. Um, you know, you may need to add more linear channels. You may need to add linear channels in local markets. Um, you know, recordings are going to grow. And, and so being able to scale, those ingest components is critical. Um, storage, I think we covered uh, in depth already and, and the ability to, to add to that as you need it for any of the use cases that apply. Um, stream capacity, the, the edge caching is really the, the, the thing there. And you know, with linear being a big driver of, of uh, concurrent capacity um, or live, you know, live events. Um, redundancy and resiliency and all of this, these, these are carrier grade systems. So um, having embedded uh, resiliency in the software and the hardware is, is critical. Um, and, and, uh, and, and cloud deployable, I, I mentioned already, and, and there's definitely a move toward more and more of that as, as customers, you know, as our customers, operators are ready for it. it it's another one of those evolutionary uh, kind, of, kind of things. Um, Bill, you want to make any comments about the architecture you've deployed and, and how you're using some of this flexibility? Um, I think I've covered most of that already, Jim, but, you know, definitely, you know, the concept of you've got a lot of stuff in your origin site, but then you're distributing your streaming capacity uh, with edge caching, you know, that you can continually move closer to the edge if you need to, to the actual customer. Um, the concept of, you know, you can start with a single deployment that's only, you know, hardware level redundancy, but then ultimately do either full redundancy from a geodiverse site or just, you know, geodiversity from that second site or evolve over time. Um, so to me, that's, you know, anytime you're deploying this type of service, you need to have that type of flexibility um, to, to be able to, you know, scale as you grow, because like, like you mentioned, on day one in your first market, you have zero IPTV customers. So to design it for a smaller number and grow it over time based on your customer's actual usage uh, is very important. And one thing we didn't really touch on, but how customers use their DVR, start over catch up, you know, time shifted services, you know, how much live are they watching? How many different channels of live are they watching, you know? Uh, if you got 300 channels, we all know that there's probably some channels that aren't being watched and some that are being watched a lot. You know, there's a lot of models in the industry of, you know, how this concurrency between the different viewing types works. The reality is your own demographics and your system are going to drive what those models ultimately are and being able to adapt your system to how your customers are actually, you know, using your content is important because this isn't necessarily a one size fits all because you're offering so many different types of, of, you know, services that your customers are viewing. Thanks, Bill. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap it up now. Um, I'm going to let Bill uh, make some final comments and then I'll, I'll close it off. Yeah. So, you know, we've, again, we've already touched on most of these, but, you know, people will continue to view, um, Video. video is the highest growing and will continue to be the highest growing segment of bandwidth usage on, on anybody's system, whether, you know, IP based, whether it's, you know, videos your kids are watching on their phone or, or your traditional video service, that's, that's not going to change. 
um, modern IPTV architectures drive more usage. Um, they do. I mean, look at the shift of people going to services like Disney Plus, you know, Netflix, kind of the, one of the original ones, and, and the multitude of OTT services. Um, and as an operator, obviously, we want to continue to drive people to our video services and hopefully drive more people back to them, you know, and come back cord cutting. Um, power the bundle again, reducing churn. Um, even though bandwidth has become our biggest, bigger piece of the, the business model compared to video, and that's the case of most operators, um, we all know that video is a sticky service and it reduces churn on your bandwidth. Uh, not your bandwidth, but your broadband bundles or your broadband service. You know, if they're bundled with video, um, you have less churn. Uh, managing infrastructure costs, certainly, and architectural flexibility. I think we've hammered on that quite a bit already that, you know, the ability to scale as you grow, to adapt to your customers' viewing habits, um, and not be stuck in just one particular, this is how it is, and we have to forklift it to change it. Great. Great. Thanks, Bill. I don't think I can really uh, add much to, to that. Uh, so, um, you know, the only, the only other thing I'll say is that, you know, that, that flexibility and having a, a, a software defined system um, that can, can uh, change and grow dynamically is, is very important as we've covered, uh, I think, in depth here today. So thanks for your time today, Bill. Thanks for helping out with this. And um, that'll do it. Thank you, everyone.